All right, welcome everybody. Um, this is our Southern California Water Dialogue. Um, I co-chair with the Zinc from the Metropolitan Water District. I am Connor Everts of the Southern California Water Alliance and other organizations. Um, I want to thank the uh, steering committee. Um, it takes a, a village to uh, put these on. Um, I want to give special thanks to um, not only Met staff, but our coordinator, uh, Kathy um, Caldwell, without whom uh, we would not have these programs every month. Um, I also want to say we are um, still uh, operating remotely. We don't know when we may have a hybrid sometime in the future, but for now we're going to uh, continue with this format. So uh, bear with us. We're all now well used to it. Um, if you have any questions, um, send them to uh, Joanne Carrillo, who you RSVP to. Um, and there's a series of uh, kind of our ground rules um, for, the, for the webinar. Um, I will be doing the initial announcement. Um, Dee will be doing the questions um, and the answers that come up afterwards. Um, you'll see on your screen how to, if you don't know this already, how to um, ask a question. Uh, those questions could also be uh, upgraded. Um, if uh, we have more than a lot of interest in the number of questions, we try to get to all of them and leave a little bit of time at the very end for them because this is a dialogue. Um, but both put in your question, and then if you if you feel the need, upgrade it. Uh, I assume you could upgrade your own question. Um, uh, <clears throat> here's our simple agenda. Uh, we have a single speaker today and then the discussion or dialogue afterwards and then some very short concluding remarks and including what's going to be coming up next month so our speaker I'm, I'm very pleased to announce that we have dr daniel swain research scientist from the ucla institute of the environment and sustainability you've probably seen his comments quotes articles um, recently and uh, just on a personal level, I would say if anyone doubted climate change and the impacts on water, uh, get outside of the irrigated urban areas as I did. And I saw Lake Casitas in Ojai, where I once served on the water board, the lakes at the lowest level since I first saw it uh, filled in 1959 when my grandmother drove me out. They said it would never fill, it filled within a few years. Um, but now it continues to drain down. So the issues are very well, well known. The whiplash we had between December and January, February, and now into March, our wet times being dry. And we will get a lot more detail and some real information on that from Dr. Swain. Take it away, please. All right, thank you for that introduction. And let me just take a moment to uh, pull up my slides. Currently, I don't have permission to share my screen, so I think somebody may have to grant me that. All right, looks like I now have that access. I'm going to share my whole screen. I'm going to have to open up that PowerPoint and then All right, it should show up full screen right now. If not, let me know, otherwise I will proceed. All right, well, as you might have gleaned from that introduction, one of the key things I wanna talk about in this setting in particular is not just the scarcity side of a warming climate, from a water perspective, although that is of course important and California is enduring it right now. Um, but some other aspects too, that may be a little bit less intuitive. Um, some, some things that I think we're sort of neglecting in the background, even as we've experienced uh, quite, a lot of, quite a lot of drought, water scarcity uh, and wildfire activity uh, in recent years. Uh, and I think it always is helpful to start out with a brief primer on California climate. Um, 
I'm assuming all of you either currently live or have lived much of your life in California. So some of this uh, probably uh, is already familiar, but some of it may be new. And the fact that California has a strongly seasonal cycle of precipitation, and in particular that that seasonal cycle of precipitation is aligned with the cool season, meaning that we have wet winters and dry summers and not the reverse, it's actually pretty unusual in a global context and even in the context of the Western US. In fact, most of the Western US sees a significant amount of summer precipitation. Most of California, with the exception of the Southeastern deserts and occasionally the Sierra Nevada, really does not. And that means that our dry season, therefore, is aligned with our hot season, our water demand season, essentially. And this is true both from an urban consumption and agricultural usage and even an ecological perspective. Most of the water uh, that is uh, needed comes at the time of year when it's not necessarily being used uh, to the same degree, and we have no new inputs of water to the system precisely at the time of year when we might need it. One of the reasons why we have uh, this seasonal cycle of uh, wet winters, dry summers, as well as a large amount of interannual variability, so uh, both very wet individual years and very dry individual years, is because California exists at a climatological margin, essentially, uh, dividing the more quiescent subtropics with the more active mid-latitudes. And that's not a static boundary. Uh, the reason why we have a wet season is because that boundary shifts southward, usually in winter, and so it's closer to uh, California or over California, so we're sort of part of the active storm track then, and shifts progressively farther to the north end of the summer, which is why it's usually high, dry, high and dry here at that time of year. It also shifts from year to year. We have uh, the, the effects of El Nino and La Nina, for example, that are particularly pronounced in Southern California, because those tropical influences are largely dictating where that subtropical boundary aligns itself in a given year, which is why Southern California does tend to be wetter during significant El Nino events and drier during significant La Nina events. There are, of course, other factors that matter and, and so isn't the end all be all of California climate, but that is the reason why it is an important influence. And because of this uniquely high year-to-year -year variability, and because we only really have a few months out of the calendar year in which to receive the vast majority of our annual precipitation, it means that California is particularly susceptible to drought. One, because if something comes along during the winter wet season months, say a persistent ridge of high pressure that we've become very familiar with in the, over the past decade, um, we're pretty much out of luck the rest of the year because there really isn't a meaningful opportunity in spring, summer, or autumn to meaningfully uh, gain back that water that we didn't get in winter. And the corollary is also that because the dry season then occurs during the summer, we just sort of dry out and bake during those warm months because if we didn't have enough water going into them, there's certainly going to be nothing new input into the system as it gets hotter and hotter going into the warm season. And so I think it's probably not so surprising uh, to most folks on this call that the climate of California has already changed. And hold on just one second, I'm gonna try and see if I can get rid of this, this thing up top. Maybe I can't, maybe it doesn't matter too much. Uh, let me just see if I can hide the video panel, is that it? No, it's, yeah, well, I don't think it's a big deal. So let me just go back here. Sorry about that interruption. Um, California is obviously a warmer place than it once was. Uh, and I think that it was somewhat subtle until maybe the last decade or so. And it's not that the rate of warming has increased so much that we've just had a sustained period of very warm years over the past decade. Pretty much all of the years in the past decade have been warmer than any year in the century preceding it in California. And that's a pretty fundamental shift, I would say, in the temperatures, even though a lot of these are subtle. As I mentioned, California is warming more across inland areas than it is along the coast, and it's warming more at cooler times of year than it is at warmer times of year. Although, to be really clear, it is warming everywhere and at all times of year. It's just that the rate of warming varies by season and location. Mountain snowpack has now already decreased uh, pretty substantially, and that's something that was a prediction about the future, say, 15 or 20 years ago, we hadn't really observed yet. 
Um, Re-looking at all of these assessments from 20 years ago and updating them really does suggest this is where we are now, where there is a meaningful decrease in the snowpack uh, and that that decrease may be accelerating even though we still get some individual really big snow years because we're also getting a lot of really abysmally low snow years and a lot of the quote unquote average years are also now resulting in below average snowpack, even when we get a roughly average amount of precipitation. Why is that? Well, it's because of the warming temperatures themselves. We've also seen a large increase in wildfire size and severity. And while that's not just a question of climate change, climate change is probably responsible for at least half of that trend and as we continue to get warmer, it's probably going to be responsible for, for the majority of that increase, uh, that continued increase in wildfire uh, size and severity. So I'll get into that a little bit more later. I really would like to get rid of this banner up top. I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. Usually it goes away. Um, Daniel, um, we can't see it. I think you're fine. Okay. Oh, great. As long as you can't see it, no, it's not blocking the titles of the slides and we're good. One of the things, one of the key things that I really wanted to emphasize in this meeting, something that I keep shouting from the hilltops, uh, really any, to anyone who will listen in California water, is that we're not headed for a future that is just drier or just wetter. We're heading for a future that is both drier and wetter. And how does that work? Well, if you look at California's long-term trend in average precipitation, there has neither been a large increase nor a large decrease over the past century. And in fact, that's consistent with climate model predictions that show the potential for maybe a slight decrease in Southern California and maybe a slight increase in Northern California, but really not a lot of mean precipitation change, even under very dramatic global warming scenarios. And that had been the line but a lot of peer reviewed research was really emphasizing for California water management and hydroclimate. Like, well, it's gonna be warmer, there'll be less snow, but precipitation won't change very much. But what it turns out is happening is that, that that's really masking tremendous changes in the spatial and temporal characteristics of precipitation uh, that are probably more important than the mean amount of precipitation from a water management and a flood management perspective anyway. These same climate models that project relatively little mean change in precipitation, which is consistent with what we've observed so far, suggest a large increase in the variability of California's precipitation across a wide range of timescales from month to month within the wet season, from season to season throughout the calendar year, and also between years. So an increase in hydroclimate volatility or precipitation whiplash, as we've termed it, across almost every imaginable timescale even as the mean doesn't change very much. And it turns out this is why the mean doesn't change very much. There is a significant increase in the number of very dry years, as well as a significant increase in the number of very wet years. It's just that if you only consider the mean, those mathematically balance each other out. In the real world, of course, those don't actually balance each other out from a flood or water management perspective. So this is a, this is a key example of where just taking an average really doesn't tell us the story at all for any practical purpose. And this is actually a pretty generalizable statement, surprisingly enough, about climate change in a warming world. Global mean precipitation is increasing steadily, but at a relatively slow rate uh, with each degree of global warming by about two or 3% per degree centigrade. But this does not mean that precipitation is increasing by two or 3% everywhere. In fact, there are some very coherent regions where mean precipitation is robustly decreasing. And there are other regions where mean precipitation is increasing at a far greater rate than two or 3% per degree centigrade. But the really interesting thing is that if you look at this map of mean precipitation change on the left and extreme precipitation change on the right, these are projections for the coming years, you can see that there's a lot more green and blue on the right map than there is on the left. In fact, there are even some regions on the right that are blue that are brown on the left, meaning that there are a number of places on Earth that see little change in mean precipitation or even a decrease in mean precipitation that nonetheless experience or are projected to experience a very large increase in the occurrence of extreme precipitation. So California is at this, at this margin in the zone where there's really not much significant change in precipitation. You can kind of see that reflected on this map but it's well within the zone where we expect there to be a very large increase in the most extreme precipitation. So in general, for a two or 3% per degree centigrade increase in 
Uh, global mean precipitation, we expect there to be about a five or 10% increase per degree of warming in the occurrence of extreme precipitations in terms of their magnitude of these events. If we think about exceeding particular historical thresholds, so how often do we hit precipitation amounts above some historically meaningful threshold, we actually see much larger than 10% per degree warming, in some cases 20 or 30% increases per degree of warming in the frequency of occurrence of some of these very most extreme events. That's very large if you've designed infrastructure to be optimal or to tolerate extremes up to a particular fixed magnitude. That's going to present some significant challenges moving forward. So I don't think I really need to motivate this among this audience, but I'll just quickly go through this anyway. Why do we even care about the uh, precipitation whiplash in the first place? Well, I think we have plenty of examples from Southern California recently. I think one of the most dramatic whiplash examples is from December 2017 into January 2018, where we went from the largest and one of the most destructive fires in state history at the time, both of those statistics have since been eclipsed, immediately to a catastrophic debris flow in Santa Barbara County that killed a lot of people and destroyed a lot of homes. But on average during that month, it was mostly sunny and breezy with below average precipitation, which of course really didn't tell us what was happening um, with respect to either of these incredibly dramatic and highly consequential extremes. So the point I really wanted to illustrate here is that if we only consider changes in average climate, and this may sound obvious, but it's done all the time, then we're really gonna miss some critically important points and potentially engage in quite severe maladaptations to the climate changing in the way that it actually is. And a broader example from a water perspective, this from Northern California, are the wild swings up in Butte County uh, and at Lake Oroville in recent years. I think the photos pretty much tell the whole story, a sequence of events from 2015 to 2017 to 2021. Um, we started with extreme record-breaking drought in 2015, and then a series of extreme atmospheric rivers, along with a particularly poorly timed engineering failure on the primary spillway of Oroville Dam, turned what would have been a fairly mundane but expensive engineering issue, uh, that, that failure of the primary spillway, into a genuine emergency, something that actually could have become catastrophic but for uh, the fact that there was a break in the weather. Uh, and that the emergency, uh, the, the, the headward erosion of that emergency spillway that threatened the 20 or 30 foot wall of water coming down the canyon into the Central Valley and facilitated the fairly frenzied evacuation of 200,000 people downstream. But now we're right back to extreme and record breaking drought in 2021. And so in that sense, you know, California is no stranger to hydroclimate extremes. It's why we have the, the geography and the ecology that we do. And it's why California's water systems are as diverse as they are, but there are still limits. And the variability we're starting to see now is already starting to eclipse what we saw in the 20th century when our water infrastructure was designed and constructed. So. Really, we're already seeing these pieces of critical infrastructure pushed to their brink and arguably beyond in some cases. As we mentioned, this increase in precipitation variability occurs on a bunch of different timescales. It's not just year to year, as I previously showed, but it's also season to season. And we actually are, have already started to experience a major drying trend in autumn throughout California. That much has already manifested itself. We're not yet seeing drier springs, but we really expect that to uh, come out of the woodwork sooner rather than later. And this year is likely to be one of those drier than usual springs. And so California's precipitation seasonality, in other words, becomes even more smushed into the winter months. We have an even shorter, sharper rainy season with drier shoulder seasons in the autumn and spring, but potentially slightly wetter conditions at the peak of winter. That certainly didn't happen this year, but this is the expectation for how things will look more often than not moving forward. So again, within this situation where there's not as much mean change in precipitation, there are still dramatic seasonal shifts in ways that are going to be problematic because of course, drier autumns mean longer fire seasons and a worse peak to fire season during offshore wind season, Santa Ana season, for example. Drier springs mean that snow melt uh, occurs earlier, uh, snow accumulation ends sooner, and water demand begins to rise earlier in the year. So you have, uh, and that again, that demand is true both from an urban, agricultural, human use perspective, and also ecologically. So it means we have longer, more severe fire seasons, 
uh, longer, uh, more intense water demand seasons, and a shorter period during which we're actually getting the water delivered to us. Even if the total quantity of water may actually be similar to what we got historically, it's coming at us in very different ways. Uh, more, over shorter, more intense bursts, and preferentially as rain rather than snow. And because this is a Southern California-centric audience, I did want to point out that there, you know, California is a big state, and there are some differences between projections for Northern versus Southern California, and they mainly are this. No part of California is really expected to see a large change in mean precipitation. I've already emphasized that. So it's unlikely that any part of California will see a dramatic decline or dramatic increase in the annual average precipitation. And this is true even with several degrees of global warming, so much more warming than we've seen now. But it is slightly more likely than not that Northern California might actually see a slight increase in wintertime precipitation, for example. And there's a slightly greater than the chance than not that the far Southern California might see a decrease, a slight decrease in mean wintertime precipitation. These are a lot, not large numbers in either case, but it does suggest that there will probably be some modest strengthening of the north-south precipitation dipole in California as well, where the places that already get more water might get slightly more in the winter, and the places that already get less water might get slightly less. But if you notice on the right, this is a plot of the change, predicted change in the variability month to month of precipitation during the wet season, showing that really the entire west, and certainly all of California, is expected to see a large increase in the month-to-month -month precipitation variability during the wet season. And that's exactly what we have seen this year, where we had in Northern California record wet conditions in October, very dry conditions statewide in November, in some cases record wet conditions again in Northern California in December, and then record dry conditions during January, February, and now for much of March across almost the entire state. So this will be a year where we've actually hit both all-time wet records and all-time dry records in the same water season. And so that's very much representative of what this purple plot on the right from a few years ago is showing regarding the future. That part of what we're experiencing right now is something that's a preview of the future where we have some, within the same winter, incredibly wet months and incredibly dry months and the balance of those dictates whether or not the winter overall is dry or wet, but it certainly looks different than what we've seen historically. And so to focus a bit on drought, because we've, we've been thinking about so much, so much about it lately, you know, how is it that droughts are getting more severe and more prolonged in California if there hasn't been much change in mean precipitation? Well, you can see up top in the plot, for example, that there really hasn't been much of a trend in mean precipitation. That, that, that just is quantitatively, the fact. those are the facts. But there has been a large increase in the mean temperature in California. And as well, a large decrease, or I guess you can kind of invert the graph, thinking about it in terms of increasing drought severity, you can see a, a clear trend towards increased droughtiness, if you will, using a drought metric, the PDSI, that incorporates both temperature and precipitation that doesn't just consider precipitation. And the reason I really emphasize this is that precipitation only drought metrics are becoming very misleading in a warming climate to the point of actually causing water supply crises in some places. And we saw this with California's Department of Water Resources last year, which you still used a runoff model that was based exclusively off of empirical relationships from his, between historical precipitation and historical runoff. That ain't going to cut it anymore. And last year is a good illustration of what happens when we try and implement these old models for a new climate. We overestimate how much runoff there's going to be because of how much warmer it is than it used to be. And that's because the same amount of rain and snow just doesn't go as far as it used to. And again, this is not because, as you well know, this is not because that the consumptive demand has dramatically increased. It's because the atmospheric demand, the basic thermodynamics have changed so that the same amount of water falling from the sky, an increasing fraction of it, just ends up evaporating back into the atmosphere rather than making it into rivers, lakes, and streams uh, and becoming potentially water used um, for humans or for the environment. This is, as I mentioned, partly because we're getting less autumn precipitation, but maybe slightly more winter precipitation, but mainly also because we're getting more precipitation on fewer days. So more intense, but fewer storms. And once again, this is what we've seen the last few years. It, it may be easy to forget, but the, the extreme October atmospheric river in Northern California 
was the greatest one day precipitation that some parts of California have ever experienced in any month in 200 years, just this past autumn. This year, the previous year, some places set similar records during the January atmospheric river, but these were both very dry winters overall in some places. And so this just goes to show you that even if you get a lot of water all at once, it's not the same thing as having it distributed nice and even, evenly over the course of a few months. We're getting less snowpack, but more evaporation that also accounts for part of this. And so all put together, this really suggests an increased risk of both drought and flood in a warming climate. And there are some other ways to sort of illustrate this paradox. Um, and I've already talked about some of these things recently. Uh, and so I won't really emphasize this slide too much other than to leave it up just to look at some of the graphics. But you can kind of see that there's an increase in both the fraction of precipitation that occurs uh, uh, on the most extreme precipitation days, the increase almost statewide in the fraction of precipitation that's occurring during those uh, core rainy season months. So again, that's another way of measuring the concentration of the rainy season into those core winter season months. And just you can just see on the far right just how dramatic and widespread the change in snow water equivalent is just about everywhere. But I also, as I mentioned, want to talk about the other side of the, the, the hydroclimate coin, and that's the increasing risk of a really severe flood. Um, many of you are probably familiar with California's Great Flood of 1862, um, which occurred uh, in the realm of newspaper records and personal journals, but before we really had official meteorological instrumentation. So all of the data we have is anecdotal and not really possible to verify. But we certainly know what the impacts were like from uh, the historical accounts and newspaper articles. And it's also clear that an event like a modern recurrence of an event like this would be uh, disastrous for California. In, in fact, uh, the USGS has dubbed this California's quote, other big one. The original big one, of course, being a large magnitude earthquake on the San Andreas Fault near Los Angeles or on the Hayward or San Andreas Fault near the San Francisco Bay Area. This event in many ways would be worse because it would affect the entire state simultaneously and would leave almost no part of the state untouched, whereas one of the big earthquakes would probably uh, be devastating in one particular region, but not everywhere. So it definitely complicates the kind of emergency response picture that would be involved. It's thought from the paleoclimate record that events of this magnitude occur roughly every one to 200 years. So rare in a human lifetime, but not rare at all in a geological context. And previous work from a few years ago of ours suggested that climate change is already increasing the likelihood of this sort of event and that there is something like a 50-50 chance of an 1862 level 200-year flood event on the statewide basis over the next 40 years. So we're not talking about making, you know, pretty dramatic projections out to 2100 when none of us, you know, will be alive. We're talking about planning horizons of 20 to 40 years. So these are the sorts of things that we really are gonna to have to probably more likely than not deal with um, within the next few decades. And so we really wanted to dig into this. We've actually done a lot of work on this on the, on the extreme flood risk side of things for the past couple of years. And as you might expect, pretty much all of California's big flood events occur as a result of uh, extreme atmospheric river storms or more likely a sequence of particularly intense wintertime atmospheric river storms. And what we found is that in a warming climate, atmospheric rivers become much more intense, mainly because there's just so much more water vapor in the atmosphere uh, as a result of that warming. Remember that the water vapor holding capacity of the atmosphere increases exponentially for a linear increase in temperature. So it's approximately 7% per degree of warming. And we're already over one degree of warming and on certainly on a path towards two or three degrees of warming. So that's a lot of extra moisture in the atmosphere, even if nothing else changes. If we had the exact same historical pattern of storms, we would sort of baseline expectation, expect them to be about 7% more intense per degree of warming. And so I think for this reason, California flood risk looms large in a warming climate. You know, California is likely to increase this risk quite broadly throughout the state, not just in Northern California, but also in the Southern California coastal plains and transverse ranges as well. In fact, California is actually a national hotspot of risk. Um, we've known for a long time that set places like Sacramento are one of the most flood vulnerable cities in the nation, second only to New Orleans and Houston. And we, we know, you know what's happened in those cities over the past decade or so. Um, our work really does suggest that widespread and very deep inundation type floods are going to become increasingly likely 
in a warming climate, even a climate that becomes more arid on average. And so how exactly will our flood protection infrastructure fare in a megastorm? Well, I'm not ready to answer that quantitatively yet, but it's something that we're working on right now as part of ArcStorm 2.0. So some of you have probably heard of the original ArcStorm scenario back, uh, I believe back in 2010, a joint effort of the USGS and a bunch of other state agencies to sort of uh, provide sort of a contingency planning exercise for California's quote, other big one. Um, but when they did that originally, they didn't account for climate change at all. There was no climate change component to that assessment. And it was using climate modeling and weather modeling tools that were decidedly, as of today, um, you know, there have been significant advances. So we wanted to redo this uh, new and improved version of Arc, the ArcStorm scenario for a warming 21st century California. And so that's exactly what we've been working on over the past two years, um, where we sort of aim to um, not only leverage the new information about climate change and the new modeling tools that are available to us, but also some lessons learned during recent events um, you know, from the, the, the crisis up at Oroville Dam, um, the, the planning versus not planning conundrum, uh, the conundrums that we continue to face during the pandemic, how difficult it is to get sustained attention, uh, even when you have an ongoing crisis in some cases. So this is a project, we actually had the initial atmospheric modeling done, uh, submitted to a journal. So hopefully it's, it's out for review as of this week. Um, but there's a lot more work still to do, and we're actively trying to seek funding partners. Um, California Department of Water Resources has been kind enough to fund the early part of this project. We're trying to work with them to get some additional funding to do the hydraulic modeling and see who actually gets flooded and how badly in this scenario. Um, but we're still actively seeking partners. So if anybody has insights or uh, leads on that front, I, I would be all ears. And just as an early preview of what that atmospheric modeling uh, component looks like, uh, I want people to look, so we have sort of a scenario from the historic climate era, so the climate of the recent past, we're already a little bit warmer than that, so the risk is a little bit higher already, and then the climate of the medium term future, so this is the second, uh, sort of two thirds into the 21st century under a high warming scenario, what the sort of arc storm, storm sequence would look like, and I just want to draw people's attention to the scale bar on the bottom here, the top end of the scale goes up to 1800 millimeters, and there are significant regions that exceed the top end of the scale here. Um, that means that certain parts of the Sierra Nevada and the, in, in some cases the transverse ranges of Southern California receive around two meters of rainfall over a 30 day period. So that's six feet of water. Um, that's a lot of inches of rain. And indeed, most of it in these scenarios does actually fall as rain rather than snow in the mountains because these storms are subtropical atmospheric river storms, it turns out. It turns out. They, they turn out to be quite warm events with very high snow levels in most cases. Um, and really not to put too fine a point on it, but we find that climate change has probably already doubled the risk of a 200 year flood event in California. So the likelihood of a mega flood is much higher than it was 20 or 30 years ago. But that increase is increase that, that increase in risk has been occurring uh, silently in the background. Because even with the doubling of the risk, it's still a really rare event. So even if you have an event that was once a 200 year event and now it's a 100 year event, or you previously had a 100 year event and now it's a 50 year event, over 20 or 30 years, you probably still won't experience it. But the problem is, is we, each, each additional degree of warming is going to increase this risk even further. And so this is something that really is going to be tied to how much the planet ends up warming. We know that a mega flood event is already possible today. It's pretty obvious because it already happened in 1862. So we don't have to invoke climate change to know that it's physically possible. But it does look like climate change is greatly increasing the odds of an event of this magnitude. And in fact, increasing the magnitude of the kinds of events that are actually plausible. So it's making these sorts of mega flood conditions both more likely and possibly increasing the upper end of what is actually possible in this part of the world. Um, and that's saying a lot because even the historical events are already quite extreme. And I, would, I will note that in some places, the plausible worst case increases in future runoff are more than 200% higher than the historically observed maxima. In fact, in some places, it's three to 400% higher. Um, that was actually a shockingly high number to us 
But it turns out that a lot of this comes from the fact that yes, you have a large increase in precipitation, maybe 20, 30, 40% increase in the amount of water that falls out of these future events relative to the historical ones. But more importantly, you have such a large shift in the mountains in the partitioning between rain and snow that you have a lot of regions that would have just accumulated snow during a biggest storm event historically that in the future just end up generating massive volumes of runoff because it's all falling as rain instead. And so it's not accumulating as snow that will melt slowly later on. It's just all entering the rivers at a very rapid pace on top of the mean increase in the intensity of the precipitation itself. So it's sort of a double whammy effect, if you will. To switch gears once again, since I do think wildfire is important from a water perspective, um, I, I, I won't spend too long on this slide. I just want to emphasize that wildfires have wildly different character depending on what they burn, how, how intensely they burn, and the ecological context. And that susceptibility to fire is a, is a function of both the background climate and the local vegetation conditions, and these can both vary over time. And that not all fires are bad, some fires are good. In fact, one of the reasons why we have such bad fires is because we excluded so many of the beneficial lower intensity of fires from the landscape for so long. But it is pretty unequivocally the case that we do have a wildfire crisis in California. So even if some fires are good, the fires we've seen recently, there have been a lot of objectively bad ones. Um, it's not necessarily bad that we've seen a lot of large fires, but it's definitely bad that we've seen 15 of our 20 most destructive fires from a structures loss perspective just in the last um, decade, less than a decade really, the last eight years, and also seven of the 20 deadliest fires. So I think everyone can agree that it's definitely bad when wildfires burn people's homes or kill people or create air pollution crises as have happened frequently in recent years. And just you know, to put this into perspective, more people have died in wildfires in California since 2017 than in all the earthquakes in California combined uh, since 1906. Um, so this has been the, the decade um, or the century even of, of wildfire. You know, that is the disaster of the decade in this part of the world. It's not to say that that couldn't change. And I would actually argue that in the future, um, it may change. We never know when we're gonna get the big earthquake. We never know which year we're gonna get the mega flood. But most recently, you know, California has been the epicenter of this, of this increase in incredibly destructive wildfires. And it seems to have accelerated in recent years actually by quite a bit. So what's driving this? Well, I, I like to say that there are these three pillars. One, um, that there's just more people in harm's way. We've expanded our urban areas and, and semi-urban areas, semi-rural areas, these subdivisions into high-risk fire zones. So even if nothing else had changed, there are more assets at risk and more people potentially in the path of fires. Um, we've also, as I mentioned, suppressed a lot of the natural fires during the 20th century, especially in forests, and this has led to a buildup of unnaturally dense and unhealthy vegetation that's a lot of it starting to die now in a warmer climate because there's so much competition for water and so much susceptibility to things like bark beetle infestations. So we now have not only more people living in harm's way, we also have more fuel and drier fuel. And then we have climate change that's coming along and really amplifying both of these first two factors by just exponentially drying out the landscape. Even in wet years, because of how much warmer it is, and how much stronger the atmospheric demand sucking that water out of the soil and out of that vegetation has become in the meantime. So what is the role of warming in this aridification that's relevant to wildfires? Well, as temperatures rise, the gap between how much water could be in the atmosphere and how much is actually in the atmosphere is rising. So this is a little bit counterintuitive because the amount of absolute water vapor is increasing, as I mentioned, with climate change by about 7% per degree of warming. This is why we're getting more intense atmospheric rivers. But the problem is, is that when the atmosphere is not saturated, we don't necessarily benefit from that increase in water vapor in absolute terms. And what ends up happening is the gap, and that it's known as the vapor pressure deficit, as that increases, it increases the propensity of the atmosphere to act as a giant sponge and extract water out of the landscape and out of plants and really dry things out. And so really what's going on is this increasing atmospheric demand for water uh, and increased uh, soil water depletion due to the warming directly is leading to vegetation that is drier and less resilient to drought. So there's uh, more mortality of trees and there's just drier stuff lying around potentially ready to burn in the first place. And so as a result of this, it's already been shown as of a few years ago that about 50% of the observed increase in wildfire area in the forests of the West can be directly attributed 
just to the temperature increases, even if we ignore changes in precipitation and other atmospheric variables, 50%, and that's as of a few years ago, I, I am pretty sure that if we redid this work uh, this year, we'd find that climate change is now responsible for more than half of the observed increase. And so in California specifically, what we found is that climate change has already more than doubled the occurrence of extreme wildfire burning conditions over the last four decades. This surprised us. That's a large increase already with only 1.2 degrees of warming. And there's no indication that it's going to level off anytime soon. In fact, even on a pretty optimistic future warming trajectory, take a look at the blue line on the right, uh, this risk is going to continue to increase for most of the coming century. So this is something that we're going to have to get used to um, and to mitigate because the climate doesn't look like it's going to give us any breaks in the coming decades. And I think it's important to emphasize that climate change really is changing the character of wildfire. It is not increasing the number of California wildfires. In fact, there are fewer wildfires in California today than there were 50 years ago. But the fires that are occurring are becoming significantly larger, more destructive, and they're burning hotter. And so it isn't that we're seeing this you know, incredible increase in the frequency of new fires. Uh, it really is the question of how intensely those fires are burning when they do occur. And that part very much is linked to the aridity of the vegetation uh, and the climate changes that are causing it, as I mentioned. And so this is what I think Jerry Brown termed uh, a few years back, the new abnormal for California wildfire. I actually like that term because I really dislike the term the new normal because it suggests that somehow we're in a uh, different but somehow uh, settled steady, steady state that we're sort of, we're, we're, we're at this new threshold that we're gonna stay there for a while. But really the new normal has changed. We're not gonna stay where we are today for more than a few years, you know, 10 or 15 years down the line, we're gonna be looking back at 2022 and saying, um, you know, wow, things have changed a lot over just 10 or 15 years. And we know the direction that these things are headed. And so new abnormal, I think does capture that because we're going to have to be accommodating this constantly shifting baseline uh, throughout the 21st century with respect to all sorts of these things, drought, wildfire, flood, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, from a water perspective, you know, wildfire, you know, it, it's relevant in its own right, of course, but I think from a water perspective, there are some specific things we worry about with respect to water quality, uh, post-fire debris flows and floods. In fact, we just published an analysis this, this coming week. Uh, it'll be out very shortly showing that the likelihood of post-fire flood and debris flow hazards is going to increase dramatically pretty much throughout the West, including California, um, as a result of the fact that you might expect if we're going to see more severe fires and we're going to see more intense atmospheric rivers and extreme precipitation, you put two and two together and you imagine what happens at the confluence of those two th kinds of things. And so just to emphasize that the catastrophe is not that we're seeing fire and forests. That part in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing and could very well be natural. The problem is that we're seeing these ever increasing fire catastrophes that are really just taking out whole towns and subdivisions repeatedly. Uh, this, is a re this is a real crisis, um, but it's not inevitable. And you know, the real crisis is that these fires are becoming more intense and entering populated areas. Um, more fires in the future is probably inevitable, more intense fires because of climate change, but increasingly severe fire catastrophes in populated areas, that part is not inevitable because there are a lot of things that we can do. Now, I know this is not primarily a fire talk, so I won't get into that too much, but just to emphasize that it's not a totally bleak situation. We are going to see a worsening fire situation, but there's a lot we can do to mitigate the consequences of that, both from a human perspective and from a, a water relevant perspective as well. And so to that end, I think when it comes to both drought and flood and fire risk, one of the keys is that we're gonna to have to be flexible in our adaptations to a changing climate because the physical reality is that we're gonna see uh, increases in precipitation intensity, but also in overall aridity, a dramatic loss of snowpack, but also longer and more intense fire seasons. And so the question is, can we mitigate these increasing hazards um, in complementary ways or simultaneously? And I think the answer is yes. And this is an acronym heavy bullet point, but things like forecast informed reservoir operations and flood managed aquifer recharge, or even coupling these two, I've heard it's called FIRO flood mar in some cases or FIRO mar. Um, it's, it's a mouthful, but it actually is a really promising way to deal with some of the physical changes that we expect to occur. Because 
on the one hand, we know we're going to see worse floods and we need to put that flood water somewhere so it doesn't cause a catastrophe in Sacramento or somewhere else in the San Joaquin Valley. But that may even be occurring in the middle of a severe drought in the future. In fact, odds are the next mega flood will probably occur under highly arid conditions leading up to it. So is there a way to take that water and do something useful with it on both ends, prevent the flood catastrophe or mitigate it at least, and also hedge against the next drought? Well, groundwater aquifers are a key way of doing that and allowing certain regions to flood on purpose to achieve some of those groundwater recharge objectives is potentially one way to do that in an episodic setting where we get these increasing extremes. The wildfire question actually has a particular, a similarly uh, fight fire with fire type of, in this case, literally intervention, uh, prescribed fire. Really, fire ecologists and fire scientists are just really trying to hammer this home recently. The fact that we really need there to be more fire on the landscape because we would much rather have it in a controlled setting where it's not burning at very high intensities on very hot, windy days. We really need to be able to, to, to manage fire better and literally use good fire to fight the bad fires. So I think that there's actually a close analogy between these two things when it comes to flood and drought and fire with fire. You can actually fight flood uh, with drought and drought with flood in a certain sense if you manage the system right. But what it means is not necessarily building lots of big new dams. What it means is you still need to do, you still do need to construct new infrastructure and think about planning differently. But it's a different kind of infrastructure than we're used to. It's mostly conveyance infrastructure and the institutional and the landowner, landowner sorts of agreements um, that would facilitate the deliberate inundation of certain regions. We already do that, for example, in the Yolo Bypass. The goal there is almost exclusively flood control, not groundwater recharge. In fact, it's not a great area necessarily to recharge groundwater. But imagine if we had other bypasses in the Central Valley, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley, on the San Joaquin River, draining the Southern Sierra watershed, that actually could serve both purposes at once, both flood control and groundwater recharge, because you'd be able to do the recharge precisely when you have an overabundance of water that you don't want to flood the cities. But these are the sorts of things that we've been talking about in the kind of partnerships that we've been engaging in recently. But really the overall point is that it's becoming quite clear that historical paradigms um, and historical management practices from the 20th century aren't going to cut it in the 21st century. And I wrote this slide last year, but I think it's, I could probably change the tense here based on what happened with DWR last year and say, um, it, it is starting to, to be, it, it has become clear that it's not cutting it as of right now. And so some closing thoughts, climate change has of course already arrived in California and California is a warmer place um, and a different place in many respects than it was when the 20th century policies were developed and infrastructure was constructed. Plausible trajectory in this part of the world is of course warmer year round uh, with more warming in some places than others, but much less snow pretty much in all the mountain areas more intense, but likely less frequent storms, increased precipitation variability and narrowing rut season, longer fire season with larger and more intense fires. Um, and all of this means from a physical hazard perspective, we can anticipate further increases in really all of the natural hazards that we're already familiar with, but they may get worse, flood, wildfire, drought, all of these. So the real question is not, will there be more of these natural hazards? The answer is yes. The question is how do we decouple these increases in natural hazards from the, 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 the disasters that they can cause in a populated human context? So how do we decouple uh, the increase in hazards from the catastrophes that they can cause? And the physical science really does suggest that we're going to need to be very flexible in the face of increasing extremes. We can't just prepare for water scarcity. We can't just prepare for flood. We're going to have to prepare for all of these things all at once because we really can't expect all of these things to happen more frequently. And so innovative management, I think, is going to be the winner uh, in a 21st century in a variety of contexts. So I think I'll leave it at that since I want to have plenty of time for discussion. Hopefully I haven't gone on too long here, um, but I'll keep sharing my screen for now so that I can go back to slides if people request that. So thank you. Well, let me first start by saying, Dr. Swain, that you are definitely worth the wait We've been trying to have Dr. Swain come and join us for a dialogue since September. And um, unfortunately, we've moved more into a scenario that um, is relevant to a lot of what he's studying and worked on. 
So um, I see the question queue um, populating right now, and I know that will continue. I just want to remind um, folks, and I think my, our staff is there to, to show you again. We're all uh, two years into Zoom probably, but the Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen. If you would put your questions there. And um, if you, again, if you would like somebody's question that has already been asked and you want to make sure we get to it today, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and, and that will help us bring it to the top. I'm generally gonna go in order the questions received. And I wanna start by answering the question we always get, which is, will the presentation be posted? And yes, both the presentation and this video will be posted on the SoCalWaterDialogue.org site, which will be shown on your screen at the end of our program today. So Dr. Swain, if I could go ahead and start with our first question. Uh, we have, and I'm gonna apologize in advance if I, don't get a name right, or I don't get terminology correct. So um, somebody will help me along the way if I get it wrong. But this comes from Tom Williams. He's asking um, if you think the current increase in temps and precips variations result from global warming. You've talked about that significantly in your presentation, but do you wanna augment that in any way? Um, yeah, I can, be, I can be pretty succinct with this one. It's very clear, um, essentially unequivocal at this point, that the observed increase in temperature that we've seen so far, both in California and globally, is the result of human-caused global warming. And there is also increasingly strong evidence that the increase in the precipitation variability, for example, that we're seeing in California is also due to human-caused uh, warming. So uh, the loss in snowpack, the, the increase in the overall uh, aridity in California, mainly due to the warming temperatures. Um, we've also shown that that is directly linked to the human-caused warming as well. And I'm going to skip over a question just for a minute because this is a second question from Mr. Williams. He's asking, can we talk in standard deviation versus climate norm, plus or minus one SD, so I'm thinking that standard deviation. Is there any skewness developing to the dry, wet sides? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, qualitatively, yes. And in the, it, it, it's, it's interesting that in future projections uh, for a much warmer California, so I was mentioning that increase in whiplash, the, the really wet years and really dry years, they're both increasing. Um, they're not projected to increase at the same rate though. So although we are expected to see absolutely more very dry and very wet years, the projected increase in very wet years is actually larger than the projected increase in the very dry years. And this is one of the reasons why we find such strong signals for increases in the risk of extreme flood events. We haven't seen any very, very wet years recently in Southern California, but if you only have to go back to 2016, 2017, um, to find the wettest year on record in Northern California. So that was the year uh, where we had the Oroville crisis, for example. So we've kind of forgotten about that, but a big part of California actually had its wettest year on record in the past decade, as well as its driest year on record twice. So in the 10 year period, a good chunk of California has had, has had its driest year on record, broken that driest year on record again, and also had its wettest year on record. So that's kind of an example, you know, it's, it's anic data, right? So that's just a sample size of three, but using a climate model, we can sort of inc synthetically increase that sample size and say, yeah, this sort of stuff we've been seeing recently is consistent with what we expect to see in the future. But the only difference is, I think at some point, we're going to see these really, really wet years emerge more strongly. We may be in a bit of a natural drier cycle right now, um, on top of this, you know, this human caused trend and towards increased variability. Um, but at some point we'll swing, you know, whatever would, would have happened naturally, we'll swing back towards wetter conditions for a period of time too. And then we'll have, you know, the climate, um, climate change souped up storms on top of that. So at some point, I would expect to see a really wet decade um, in the next few decades. But the problem is I can't tell you which one. It could start next year or 30 years from now. And it's very dry right now. Okay, our next question comes from Carl Seckel, and he starts out by complimenting you on your website. So we may want to uh, provide that information to everybody so that they can also see. Uh, but Carl is asking, in your opinion, is the occurrence of the blocking high in the Northwest the main factor in controlling precipitation in California? Is the blocking high the same as the 
MJO effect. Sorry, Carl, I don't know what the MJO effect is. Can you explain? Yeah, and hopefully I'm still screen sharing. I think that my blog and my Twitter accounts are up on the screen right now if I'm still screen sharing. You but, are not screen sharing right now, but we can change that. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me let me just do that so that I can uh, since I have my contact info up, let me just go and reshare. Sorry, I just have to exit so I can reshare again. We can also make it available. Um, all right, should be up on the screen again now. We are seeing it, thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, if California has a really dry year or a really dry month or a really dry season, it is almost exclusively because there's some sort of persistent high pressure somewhere either over California or to our west or northwest. You know, that is sort of, that's the mechanism. And it's mainly because, you know, all of our water comes from Pacific storms, which come from the west. The, wet stream, the jet stream over the Pacific Ocean blows from west to east. That's the storm track. If the jet stream gets deflected away from California uh, by the high pressure, it, it it's exclusively gets deflected away to the north. So often those storms are still out there over the Pacific, but they're making landfall in British Columbia or Alaska or something instead of California. Um, in fact, that's what we've seen. Some of these recent record dry years in California have been record wet in the Alaska Panhandle or Southern Alaska, for example. So. Those atmospheric rivers are out there and they're even more intense than they used to be, but they just aren't coming here is the problem. And the, the MJO that was mentioned, that's I think a reference to the Madden-Julian oscillation. It's a, yeah. That's a mode of tropical variability uh, in the coupled ocean atmosphere system. And it actually gets pretty complicated pretty quickly, but the long and the short of it is, if you know what atmospheric teleconnections are, the, the, the notion that the, the conditions in the ocean or the atmosphere in some geographically remote place thousands of miles away can actually have direct implications for weather, you know, in some completely different part of the world. California's weather is actually more influenced by the, the Western tropical Pacific Ocean than by the Pacific Ocean just a thousand miles offshore. So we have a really strong influence on a bunch of different timescales from the tropical Pacific Ocean thousands of miles away. This is one of El Nino La Nina cycle is one example of that. That's a mode of tropical ocean variability that very much affects California precipitation. The Madden Julian oscillation is a natural mode of variability that it operates on a much faster time scale. So we have MJO variability every winter that you sort of cycle through a bunch of different phases multiple times. So El Nino La Nina, you might get one year in one phase, one year in another phase, and one year in between. With the MJO, it might fully cycle two or three times per winter uh, in an active year. So uh, it, it's kind of like a mini El Nino or mini La Nina, if you will, where it influences the tropical California connection for a week or two at a time rather than for the whole season. So you can kind of think of El Nino and La Nina as this slow, gradual tropical oscillation that affects California. And the MJO is this high frequency oscillation relative to ENSO that affects California. And the MJO can be linked to ridging in some cases that prevents uh, California precipitation, but it actually is not very clear cut. And there are like this winter, for example, the MJO hasn't been super strong and yet we've had very persistent ridging. So in this particular example, it, it probably isn't forced by the MJO. It's, it's caused by something else. So there's a constellation of factors that are important. The MJO is definitely one of them. Um, ENSO is another one on longer time scales. But it's increasingly clear that things like Arctic sea ice probably matter uh, as well, and as well as natural internal variability. So sometimes we just get uh, bad luck, essentially. But there's a combination of climate change, random bad luck, uh, and other random variability in the system that all sort of combine to create what we actually see unfolding in front of us. Dr. Swain, you used the term ridging, and I remember, in fact, I think my, my first paid attention to you for the ridiculously resilient ridge. But That's right. um, for other people in our audience, can you just make sure it's clear that what, what you're talking about? Yeah, so a ridge in an atmospheric science context really just means a, a region of, of uh, persistent high pressure, high barometric pressure. Um, the only difference is it's usually referring to high pressure sort of in the middle of the atmosphere rather than at the surface. So at, at a level that's uh, more relevant for the jet stream, which is, um, you know, uh, 30,000 feet up um, because that affects the storm track most directly. So really what it just means is persistent high pressure when we refer to 
to ridging in the atmosphere. And the reason why it's called a ridge is it's a, uh, if you look in two dimensional space, like at a map, um, you, a ridge literally looks like a hill uh, relative to a region of unusually low pressure, which looks like a trough or a valley. So that's where the terminology comes from. Thank you. And Carl has a second question, and he's asking, where is the state of predicting future precipitation patterns to help with planning the future water supplies? Yeah, it's a good question. One of the big challenges in the prediction space is that we have great weather forecasts now out a week, maybe two to three weeks under certain conditions. Um, and we have pretty high uh, confidence climate projections uh, on multi-decadal timescales, but that's probably because we're asking different questions. One is deterministic for a weather forecast. I want to know if there's going to be a big storm next week, not what the general likelihood of a big storm in January is overall, but like, no, specifically, you know, on January 13th, what's the likelihood of a big storm? On the multi-decadal climate prediction perspective, we're not trying to predict the specific occurrence in a particular month or season or even a year or decade. We're trying to say, in general, on this multi-decadal period, probabilistically, we can tell you about shifts in the likelihood of extremes or the mean or whatever. Um, so the question is different. And we're both skillful at doing the former on a very short time scale and the latter on a very long time scale. Almost all the planning relevant time horizons occur in between uh, two weeks and 30 years. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, that's this, this, this valley of, um, uh, of death, as it's sometimes called in the predictability world, which is really unfortunate because it's the time scales, you know, it's a wide range of time scales, literally from weeks to, to decades in the future, where it would be most useful to have this information. And we don't really have great predictability yet. We are getting better at seasonal predictability. So there is some increasing skill for probabilistic outlooks, uh, maybe three to nine months out. So that does start to become useful in planning time horizons, but the skill is still modest and conditional. It turns out the skill is better than it used to look uh, if you know when to apply it. There are some years where there just won't be really any predictability uh, based on the state of ENSO or the NJO or the sea ice or whatever. There are other years where we could probably expect there to be good predictability. So if we can better learn to differentiate between the years where there's just no information in the initial conditions and years where there is a considerable amount of information in the initial conditions, I think our skill scores are going to increase a lot. Um, this year, was a year when everyone was skeptical of these seasonal forecasts, and yet they ended up being pretty good. We obviously got really wet conditions in October in Northern California that weren't necessarily a part of that prediction, but the overall outlook that it would be uh, near average precipitation to start the winter, but that it would progress to dramatically drier throughout the rest of the winter and the spring, well, that appears to have essentially panned out from a precipitation perspective. So chalk one up to a, a predictive success from these seasonal models. Predicting temperatures is now, unfortunately, at least from a probabilistic perspective, if you're trying to categorize them as warmer or cooler than average, um, it's, you know, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's always warmer than average now, um, almost without exception. And so that part has become nominally uh, straightforward. So essentially what we have are uh, is this gap where we're getting better at seasonal prediction. I do think there's about to be some rapid advances in sub-seasonal prediction, which is good because that's really going to help us with FIRO and, and managed aquifer recharge. So I'm optimistic that there will be significant advances in the next five years with sub-seasonal prediction. So say like two to nine, you know, two to eight weeks in advance or something like that. Um, but the multi-year prediction, like decadal prediction, that's that's starting to get, um, we haven't made a lot of progress, honestly, and there's not an immediate prospect to get better at prediction for a few years out to a decade out. So we may kind of be stuck with great weather forecasts, decent sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasts optimistically in the next few years, almost no information what's gonna happen from about two years to 10 years in the future, and then progressively better information about what might happen 20 or 30 years out. It's complicated, but it, and it's kind of weird in that sense. Well, this next question from Carlos Carrillo is related to that, and it's it's about trying to look to the past and incorporate the future. So, first, Carlos is a longtime reader of your Weather West blog, and he is um, appreciative of that. 
but he's specifically saying that we're all trying to figure out a good methodology to incorporate climate change to modeling that uses past weather as inputs. Um, he mentions two broad methodologies using more recent sequence of weather variation, looking at the past 30 years, for example, rather than 50, that may better capture variability or by making, excuse me, making modify, modifying our existing full sequences of observed weather variation to incorporate a more polarized, more frequent dry sequences, less frequent, more intense weather sequences. Do you, bottom line, do you believe either of these methodologies are better or see strengths and weaknesses? And do you know of anyone who's exploring best practices for this type of work? Well, thank you, by the way. Um, when it comes to, you know, as a climate scientist, we use generally physically based models. So, I, and this is, this is probably worth emphasizing, climate models are not, and weather models for that matter, to make what, daily weather predictions, they're not built off of historical empirical relationships. So these are not like models you would use in ecology or economics, where you sort of get a bunch of data historically, you fit a curve to it, and then you use that sort of model, whether it's a linear or some other form of model to predict the future. That's not how atmospheric models work. Instead, they're based on fundamental physical relationships. So literally the, the mechanics and the fluid dynamics, the laws of thermodynamics, conservation of mass, all of that, that's fundamentally what weather and climate models are. And so force equals mass times acceleration, for example, uh, that's something in a weather and climate model. And that's not going to change even if the planet were, you know, 10 degrees warmer. Um, so the stationarity of those fundamental physical relationships remains. So one of the things that I keep trying to convince people to do is to build physically based models and to use and implement physically based models using relationships to the greatest degree possible that don't change. The numbers, the, the inputs are changing in a warming climate, but the underlying physical laws aren't changing. So um, you might have a different balance of forces. You might have a more energetic thermodynamic system, but you know, conservation of mass is gonna be true no matter how much it gets warmer. Conservation of energy is not gonna be violated no matter how much warmer it gets. So in a climate model context, that's how we approach things. I think if you need to, if, if you essentially you're, you're modeling something that you, where you have to go the empirical route. One option is yes, to update your, your data uh, to use the most recent data. I think that's a minimum, a bare minimum thing to do. But as I mentioned, this is the problem with the new abnormal uh, paradigm, which is that you were never really gonna reach a new stable condition. So unless you're updating your model constantly, um, and even if you are, you're still going to miss, you know, the range of what is plausible in the present era. You know, the last 30 years of data may not capture what could have happened in the last 30 years, for example, at, you know, had things evolved slightly differently. So one option is to use sequences of synthetic weather and climate from climate models, for example. So, you know, maybe we don't know exactly the sequence of weather we're going to get for the next 20 or 30 years in California, or even for this year. But we actually have these huge ensemble model simulations that have been successfully downscaled to a very fine scale in California, um, where you could actually say, let's just pretend that this wide range of outcomes that are in the climate model ensemble are what could have happened during this period. So for example, for the 20th century, um, we've run the climate model, the same model 40 different times using the same assumptions at the boundary, but slightly different initial conditions, meaning that we have 40 completely unique sequences of individual weather events over the same 20 year period in the same climate era. So you actually have a much wider range of what's possible. And you can imagine how this sort of advances forward. We do this in the forward direction too, thinking toward the future uh, where we have um, these similarly numerous sequences of independent evolution of weather events moving forward. So you could actually use those because, you know, these climate and weather models are producing data that you can transform and kind of treat it as if it were your historical data. So that's something that I'm increasingly recommending people use or these bias corrected climate model data um, to calibrate these models and to make future predictions. That's really helpful, thank you. I'm gonna bring this down to a little more practical level. We have um, some folks that are interested in what they can do given the, the swings in climate and our current drought. And so Marcel Fermi is asking, if you think there is room for private companies to, I'm sorry, I just, I think I just got something bumped up on me. 
sorry, our questions <laughs> move up. So what's your thought on rain barrels and having every new home mandatorily equipped with one? And will this impact water flows really? Or maybe the question would be, will water flows, will this be a good resource for uh, residents and businesses given the current and anticipated hydrology? I mean, I think that we're really gonna to have to take an all of the above approach to water in California. So both local small micro scale interventions and large scale interventions. Um, I think in some, you know, residential context that, you know, especially for like outdoor irrigation, uh, there's no reason why, you know, water, water bills uh, aren't a good idea. The only problem is they're more useful in places where you get year round precipitation where they can refill during the dry season. For example, most parts of California, it's gonna fill during the winter you're going to start using it during the spring and then it'll be gone by the time summer starts. So um, it's something, but it, it, California's climate maybe isn't as well suited to that. But there are other sorts of things like really urban reuse of water, gray water systems. Like these are the sorts of medium scale interventions that I think are going to be really effective where, you know, there's a lot of water in urban areas that, that could be recycled or could go towards irrigation um, that's currently ending up, uh, you know, at a water treatment plant. Um, so, or, or that's, you know, that's currently ending up at a water treatment plant and then getting, you know, flushed out to the ocean. So those are the sorts of medium scale interventions that I think are important. Also, you know, I mentioned the large scale ones, like thinking about flood mar and FIRO and stuff like that. Um, there's also city scale, like urban interventions that would both, uh, increase, uh, you know, the capacity of aquifers and decrease flood risk decreasing the impervious paved surfaces as much as possible in, in urban areas, I think is gonna be a big part of this because we actually foresee a large increase in the flash flood risk with a lot of these future events. Um, a lot of the reason why we don't have as much water in the groundwater near urban areas is because all of the water lands on pavement and concrete and runs off into the rivers and ends up quickly going out to the ocean. If more of that water soaked in locally, we'd be in better shape ecologically and from a groundwater perspective. I mean, we've all seen what happened, for example, uh, in New York City this past year, uh, you know, a major impervious uh, urban area that got a huge amount of rain over a few hours and had really catastrophic flash flooding. Um, that's something that could happen in California. I mean, I know we don't think about it very often, but it, that could happen in LA, for example. So. Uh, this is very much something that I think like decreasing the impervious fraction, having uh, swales and even if they're small scale, like, you know, like, a, you know, a few square meters of, uh, near the curb on a, on a major boulevard, these are going to be really helpful in addition to the large scale interventions. And so I, I do think a, a wide range of, of these sorts of interventions from household scale to, you know, river basin scale are going to be really important. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Lynn Planbeck. She's saying that her, their, um, where she is, their urban water management plan and their um, GSP are based on DWR's climate change estimates. And she's concerned that these are inaccurate beca uh, based uh, because the temper temperature's increasing and precipitation variations plus aridity. So when will these be included in DWR's calculation? And she's asking this question to everyone. So if others know, and um, Dr. Swain, you're not familiar with what DWR is doing in terms of their planning, um, maybe somebody else can pop the response in. Yeah, I'm actually curious if anybody else has a response. I mean, one thing I will say is that I agree, I share that concern that the most recent climate uh, science information has not yet made it into state level planning. Um, on the other hand, I do know DWR is working on it. They have offered funding uh, directly to us to work uh, on ArcStorm 2.0, for example. And in particular, uh, Mike Anderson, who is also the state climatologist, but he's, he's, uh, he's part of DWR, of course, um, has been a huge booster of this. And I know he's been he's been fighting the good fight for years, actually, um, to get the best climate data uh, and the most up-to-date climate science incorporated. It's, as you might imagine, I think it's a slow process um, in a bureaucratic setting. Um, also, Carla Namath um, has been a good advocate. Uh, you know, I've spoken with her one-on-one -on, -one on several occasions in the past year. And so I think things are changing. My sense is that things are changing pretty quickly, actually. And although the gears can still be slow to turn, I think that 
you know, in the last two or three years relative to the two or three decades before, I'm, I'm noticing a significant uh, difference in the rate at which this new information is starting to get incorporated. But I am curious to hear other people's perspectives on that. Perhaps also the urgency. Well, if somebody um, knows more, go ahead and pop it into the chat so that we can uh, see that response. And I'm going to move to Charming Evelyn's question. Uh, she says, you predicted that the 100-year flood event would be most devastating in highly populated areas. What, is, what are some of your suggestions for mitigation? More park space with groundwater recharge is a question or a suggestion? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. You know, and I often point this, I, I often emphasize that, first of all, we have two very different kinds of flood risks in California. There's the one, there's the most obvious one. Everyone thinks about the Central Valley in Sacramento, right? So the San, Sacramento and San Joaquin uh, floodplains are enormous. In fact, they include naturally most of the Central Valley absent the flood protection levee system. And I would argue under sufficiently extreme event, they probably will still encompass most of the Central Valley despite the flood protection system because um, some of these structures you know, the most resilient of them are designed, the life protection levees in, in urban areas are designed to, you know, pr to protect against a quote unquote 200 year flood. Um, professionally, I significantly disagree with how the 200 year flood has been defined. I think that the 200 year flood is actually a lot bigger than has been assumed in designing a lot of the water infrastructure. So I, first of all, even those levees, I am not convinced really offer 200 year flood protection. And then in a lot of other areas outside of those zones, you know, no one even pretends that the levees are going to offer 200 year flood protection. Um, you know, some of these, you know, in the Delta, for example, or in certain parts of the agricultural areas in the Central Valley, which are no longer just agricultural areas, there are now subdivisions and people living in these places. Um, you know, they're built by, by farmers um, with pack animals over 100 years ago. You know, it's just dirt and rocks. They weren't engineered, they were just sort of uh, plowed into place if you will. So we do have some uh, high grade life protection levees, but in a sufficiently extreme event, even those might not be enough. So yes, I would say that one of the big interventions is actually to, you know, quote unquote, let the rivers do their thing, not try and constrain them in the worst case scenario, but actually let them flood as much as possible while still protecting the, you know, the relative handful of places that we really can't afford to flood truly critical infrastructure and populated urban areas are obviously the main priority. In a bad enough flood that you, you cannot prevent flooding everywhere. It's just like the wildfire thing. Um, there's no no fire option and there's no no flood option, but hopefully there's still an option where we don't flood Sacramento or where the LA River doesn't catastrophically come out of its channel in you know densely populated, populated urban LA County. And the way to do that is to let the water go somewhere else. So I really do think that Levy setbacks, parkland, um, conditionally using some agricultural regions, you know, um, not unilaterally, but after discussion with landowners and farmers and agribusiness, like, you know, where can we afford, you know, we don't have to do this every year, we probably don't even have to do it every decade, but if the once in a, you know, a century event flood comes, let's put in a, you know, a place, an agreement that we can deliberately flood your orchards for two weeks. It won't happen often, you might have some losses, but you'll be compensated if it happens that sort of setup and retooling a policy and infrastructure system to accommodate that is gonna be one of the big things that helps in the Central Valley. In places like urban LA County, it's more tricky because you don't really have anywhere to put these large bypasses. There really aren't any areas that it would be totally okay to flood. There are maybe some, some minor exceptions, but in general, it's tough. You know, the LA River Channel is mostly paved with concrete. Um, so it has, a, it has a, a high but finite capacity. And, you know, you talk to the Army Corps, they say, oh, there's no chance that there'll ever be enough water to overtop this channel. Well, we'll see what Arc Storm 2.0 shows, uh, but I don't think that that's, you know, I don't think we can rest on our laurels there either. So I think that there's lots of different kinds of interventions that we're gonna need to do, but there is no one size fits all approach. The approach for the, you know, the Central Valley is gonna be different from urban LA County, which is gonna be different from the San Francisco Bay Area, for example, where there's, you know, a combination of, of you know, ocean, ocean level rise, bayfront flooding, storm surge flooding with higher sea levels. There's the Delta where you have saltwater intrusion issues. Um, it's really gonna be a, a systems level um, problem to solve because there's going to be, have to be a lot of different kinds of interventions depending on where you are.
Daniel, we have a few more questions and we're getting low on time. So I just wanna see if I can triage here a little bit. Laura Schellenberger um, is saying, you may not know the answer to this, but how do we get the public and agencies to invest the hundreds of millions of dollars in flood infrastructure and flood mar and stormwater capture while simultaneously trying to get them to conserve water in a drought? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's tough. And it's actually the same PR challenge that we're having with on the prescribed fire landscape, which is to say um, that how do you convince people that we need to burn more land when people's houses are burning down, people are dying, you're seeing these Blade Runner orange skies all the time. Um, oh, I didn't realize my, my video was frozen like that. Um, but in any case, um, I think that you know, what we found, uh, or what, the, you know, in ArcStorm 1.0, what they found actually um, was that the, uh, the occurrence of a modern recurrence of like an 1862 level flood scenario um, in 2022 dollars, I'm, you know, I'm internally uh, rounding up for inflation. They found that it would probably have economic consequences exceeding a trillion dollars. One, not a billion, a trillion, which would make it the most expensive uh, disaster ever to occur on planet Earth in modern history, or really, I suppose, in, in history period. Uh, so if that's the consequence, even chipping away at that, you know, even reducing the impact of that event by 20 or 30 percent, um, you know, think of the cost effectiveness from that perspective to avoid, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of what could be a trillion dollar economic disaster all of a sudden it makes spending hundreds of millions of dollars sound like a very reasonable investment or arguably even billions of dollars, like, like a reasonable investment, given how, you know, given the, given what you would avert. I know that's not often how we think about things. And I know that unfortunately the pandemic has been a great example of how we don't think that way at national or regional levels in terms of um, trying to solve underlying problems before they become very expensive. But um that's really the way I would think about it. I mean, if the, what is the cost of not doing this? Yes, the cost of addressing these problems are going to be steep, but they're less steep than the cost of not addressing them. That's sort of the framing that I've been using when I talk to policy, policy folks in Sacramento, you know, when I talk to folks at DWR. This is something that we really can't afford not to do. Thanks, Daniel. Um, just a couple more that are a little bit different. Uh, this one's about the significant increase in wind events, and if there's any connection um, to the data that you're seeing right now. Seems like we've had weekly high wind alerts in SoCal. Yeah, um, you know, interestingly, when we look at the data, we don't see a large increase in, in wind events necessarily. There are some localized increases over decades, but there isn't really a systemic trend in any particular season in California. And, you know, in a warming climate, that's actually not something that we necessarily expect to increase either, are, are, are the winds. Um, in fact, if anything, there actually might be a slight decrease in winds overall in a warming climate in certain parts, although that's not really very clear. The, we have less certainty in what the winds are going to do than we do, certainly than we do with temperature and probably even less than precipitation. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure that we can attribute the recent short-term trends. It does, I, I do agree that anecdotally, it definitely does feel like there's been a lot of major wind events in the last few years. But when you look at the data, there just isn't a really robust long-term trend and there isn't really a theoretical expectation that there should be either. So uh, I would put that in the TBD category, but in my, you know, my current thinking, that's not one of the large changes that I necessarily think are going to be prominent. Okay, thank you. And then in terms of being, this is, un, and I didn't say names last time, this is BJ Atkins. In terms of being unnerved by some of the findings, uh, what confidence interval do you ascribe to your findings? And if you could review 4,000 years of data versus 150 years using the same technology and data quality, how might a longer horizon impact your confidence level? Um. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's more, there's more scientific confidence in some of these things than others. Uh, the number one thing, as you might expect, is that it's, it's getting warmer and it's going to continue to get warmer. That's 100%. I mean, there's, there's, in, in, unless uh, we get particularly unlucky with a, a meteor impact or something of, of that order, um, there is pretty much no way around that physically. In terms of precipitation, uh, there is more uncertainty. 
Um, as I mentioned, it's not totally clear whether California might actually get slightly wetter or slightly drier on average from a precipitation perspective. And yet, despite that uh, relative uncertainty in the mean, there is pretty, there is very high uncertainty, I would say, um, exceeding 90 to 95% confidence that the wettest wets will get wetter. And if we take these combined drought metrics like temperature and precipitation ones, um, the fact that we're going to see more prolonged and more severe droughts using that kind of holistic drought definition, that's probably on the order of 95% confidence as well. And I will point out that although we only have about 100, really only about 100 years really of higher quality historical data, that is one of the key things about being able to use process-based climate models and weather models is that we actually can, can create synthetic data sets of thousands of model years. And so we can go into the past. In fact, we do have 4,000 model years of data going into these projections for ArcStorm, for example. We actually do have 40 different replications of the 100-year historical period, for example. And so while the model is not the real world, we've shown that it actually does a quite good job of representing the real world. And so um, you know, within some reasonable uncertainty bounds, we actually can quantify what is happening in a, you know, using a vastly larger sample size, and we're, we're not just restricted to what has happened in the observed history, we can greatly expand upon that and sort of develop a much larger synthetic sample size and using those sorts of approaches too. Thank you, Dr. Swain. I'm gonna invite Con uh, Connor Everts to come back and close out our program this morning. There was one more question about atmospheric river trajectories significantly increasing the difficulty of forecasting form reservoir operations. So I don't know if you wanna comment on that, but anything that we didn't respond to today, we're gonna to keep the lines open afterwards and we'll try to provide information following the event. Connor? Thank you, Dee. Uh, great job as always, and uh, just want to thank our presenter, Daniel, and um, all the people that helped put this together. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the program. It is somewhat overwhelming hearing the realities of these, even though we're beginning to experience them ourselves. Um, but I think the focus on what we can do about it and how we can adapt uh, is going to be a focus we're going to have in future dialogues as well, but it's good to have the real information. Um, behind it so we can fully understand it. Um, again, on a personal level, uh, I went to visit a family in uh, British Columbia for Christmas and got their uh, coldest, wettest um, winter snow and ice event. And six months earlier, they had had the hottest temperature in all of Canada and the town that had it burnt down three days later. Uh, in between, all within six months, they also had a tornado. So this is a place that we consider maybe I had thought of as a retreat or very um, kind of consistently cool wet weather, but even there, and they don't always have the ability to deal with these changes rapidly. So everything is impacted, including the environment. Um, so we, we will again, focus on the changes as we move forward in this hotter, drier, and sometimes wetter times. Thank you all for your time. Our next meeting is also on the fourth Wednesday of the month um, on the 27th. Um, again, you need to register for the Zoom. Uh, we will send out the agenda beforehand. Um, and uh, may we all move together in these uh, often difficult times. Thank you all very much. <laughs>